this is The Breakdown. Welcome to The Breakdown. I am your host, Minister Dom. I'm so excited to be here with you all on today to break down the conversation with my Candler and Dancish family. Give it up, give it up, give it up. So we have an amazing panel here on today. So what we're going to do, we're going to start left and go to right. And let's introduce ourselves, panel. As a matter of fact, can we come in just a little bit? Just a little bit. Yep, yep, yep. Awesome. All right. Starting with the polka dots. What we got? Polka dots? <laughs> Theological Seminary and the proud director of the Candler Advantage Program. Whoop, 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 whoop. Welcome. Welcome to the space. Welcome to the space, Dr. Kim. Next, who we got? My name is Ossie White. I'm a third year MDiv student at Chandler School of Theology while serving as a pastoral resident at uh, Dunwoody United Methodist Church. Woo! Welcome. I am Katie Wax. And I am a rising third year MDiv student here at Candler School of Theology. And I currently serve as the social justice pastor at Inman Park United Methodist Church. Woo! Welcome! Uh, I'm Trace. I'm also a third year Candler student. I'm currently an intern at Church of the Common Ground at this church in downtown Atlanta. Woo! Welcome! I'm Andrea Bryant, and I'm also a rising third-year MDiv student. I have been doing my internship at Triune Mercy Center, and I'm going to save this grass for later. <laughs> 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 um, Megan, I'm a third-year uh, student at Camera School of Theology, and I serve as the assistant director of Young, young Adult Ministry at St. Mark Young Methodist Church. Good. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Kimberly Stevens, also third year MDiv, serving with Women in Transition at Metro Transitional Center. Woo! Woo! Welcome. Great to have you. Yes. And I'm Charlotte, third year Master of Divinity. I got that right. Um, and I've also served as a pastoral resident at Dunwoody United Methodist Church. Woo! That's what's up. And again, I am your host, Minister Dom, and I'm so excited that you all are here for the breakdown. So as Candler Advantage um, students or participants, we have been charged with having um, an engaging experience over the summer. And so I have a couple of questions about you and your ministry. Um, Minister Trace, let us know, when did you realize that you had been called to ministry? I was working at a summer camp in 2015, um, and thoughts started racing uh, through my head about how to solve the problem. And I was sitting in worship, not really paying attention to the music. Um, and what came across my mind was, I should preach about it. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I was sucked into the worship service. Mm -hmm. I took that as a yes from God. Okay, good, good, good stuff. Andrea, what about you? How were you called to ministry? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say I wasn't necessarily called at a specific time. Mm -hmm. um, I was called to seminary at a specific time. Mm -hmm. But I feel like my gifts have just been um, more visualized or apparent to me recently. Um, and using them in ministry has been more of my call and seeing where God is leading me. So it's changed over time. I like it. What about you, Katie? How were you called to ministry? Well, I was 12 years old in 2010, and I was a rising seventh grader at a United Methodist Virginia Conference leadership event. Uh -huh. And um, we were up on the top of this really big mountain in Roanoke, Virginia, and there's this star um, that lights up in multiple different colors, um, but we were up there embracing the moment and then went down for communion and foot washing. And um, in that moment and in that experience, I heard, my child, I'm calling you um, wow. to my kingdom to serve with my people. 
Wow. Um, and since then, uh, at the age of 12, I came back on fire, um, and I fought it for a little bit, um, but I have continuously seen um, God lay out the path that um, God continues to call for me. That's good. That's good. Pastor Asi, so, you know, we understand that sometimes ministry is hard, mm -hmm. right? It gets a little challenging. It gets a little demanding. Mm -hmm. How do you find joy in ministry? Ooh, yes. I find joy in ministry really for what ministry is. You mm -hmm. um, have the opportunity to connect with um, folks and be different uh, places and be in the church or outside of the church, but ministry at large, I find that the connection, the stories, the 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 days where I feel the most empty or just like tired and exhausted, I walk into a blessing, into a um, a space where I'm like, wow, like thank you God for allowing me to encounter this person mm -hmm. or this um, this particular ministry engagement or a uh, project that we're working on and. Um, I walk away with, wow, I thought I was empty, or I, that I, you know, thought I couldn't make it through the day, but now um, through this testimony or a person sharing their story or being there, um, you know, actively participating with me, uh, just I, I find so much joy in that. Um, and then, of course, uh, I think the ebbs and flows of, of ministry, right? Knowing that uh, there's going to be good days and there's going to be hard days and bad days at times, and um, disappointing days, sad days, mm -hmm. and, you know, death. Everything that we uh, are able to do or we're blessed to do in ministry is uh, fascinating. I reflect back on, uh, I'm a PK, so mm -hmm. on some of my stories from my dad. Um, and one day he did a funeral, um, but then he got a call as he was headed home and turned around and went to the hospital to um, help deliver uh, one of his nephews. And so just in one day, the intimate moments that we get to experience in mm -hmm. ministry of, of death and life um, and this resurrection of God, kind of just being with us and walking with us each and every step of the way, it just, it's, um, it's, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. That's good. Pastor Megan, knowing the things that you know now, what would you say to yourself when you initially started out in this path? On this path to ministry. In ministry, yes, in ministry. Hmm. I think I would just say to, I would tell myself to slow down mm -hmm. and to enjoy each moment for what it is. Mm -hmm. I think when I first started to discern a call to ministry, I was experiencing um, a community that was very transformative for me. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, this is what it looks like. This is what doing ministry the right way looks like. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And um, I think every experience that you have is valuable for different reasons and teaches you something new about yourself. And so. Um, there's things that we do that are a learning lesson because it teaches you about what you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. There's things that we do that um, just fill you up and you know set you on your course. And so, but we take all of it um, and we learn to integrate it and to um, continue on. And so I would just say um, you're going to learn a lot and just take it as it comes. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. So, Pastor Kimberly. Yes. No. I'm sorry. Wait. Kimberly. Yeah. It's all right, Kimberly. I'm sorry. It's all right. It's all right. So, God won't heal what you hide, and he won't fix what you fake. With that thought, how are you maintaining your authenticity to minister in a relatable and relational way? All right. <laughs> yes. I love it. Oh Say that again a I little bit longer. Things that are worldly, and I teach about them, and it's things that I've heard 
heard people share and the, the, the tears I've heard people cry and the things they've asked me to pray over and the advice that they've asked for and I say, do you want a scripture or do you really want a practical answer? Mm. And they always want the practical answer and say, but if you have a scripture, I don't mind reading it. And so I, that is, that's me, you know, that's as real as that. can be. What is your life? Um, where is your life? And mm-hmm. how did you get there? And um, if you don't desire scripture, that's fine. I'm still going to give you Jesus. You mm-hmm. just won't know that he, he slipped in there just like a nice little medicine drop that your mom never tells you about. Yeah. I like that. I like that. So, Pastor Charlotte, you know, um, aside from the Bible, what books influence you as a minister? Mm. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, now I'm not to come to mind. Um, but anything theological... Um, But also, there's a beauty and a truth to the fact that it doesn't have to explicitly say theology Mm -hmm. or scripture to provide a basis to help us understand how to love, Mm -hmm. how to engage in the world, uh, how to be present in the world. Um, You know, uh, maybe what, like, I know for myself, I should probably read more fiction. I read a lot of nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just what I do. I love to learn, and I love to read books and ask questions. Um, But I think, if anything, um, the books to turn to for theological formation could be anything you want them to be. Because I think if there's the intentional focus and practice um, into reflecting and actually thinking and engaging with what you're reading, um, it's going to be theologically formational. It's going to provide... That's good. The stories in this real world application that gives you access to something you didn't have access to before. That's good. Yeah. That's good. I'm going to just throw this one up and whoever, you know, it hits your belly. Um, maybe Dr. Wagner um, would possibly could share, considering that you, out of all of us, are been a pastor. Um, as a church member, what can we do to encourage and support our pastors? Mm-hmm. I'll take the first run. And I'll okay. Hear what other people have to say too. Um, and I'm going to share my experience here. My uh, first year of ministry was really wonderful. My second year of ministry was really hard, and that's because the senior pastor. Um, had a bit of a breakdown, um, mm. and he had been there 31 years at that point, mm. and he was deeply beloved by the congregation, but he was no longer able to serve in the ways that he had before, mm. and so a lot of the burden of serving that church fell on me. I had been out of seminary one year, um, exactly, mm. and um, had been at that congregation one year, exactly, but all this kind of started to fall apart. And the first six months of that time, four months of that time, I carried that burden alone and thought nobody could help me. And thought that it would be embarrassing to him for me to share some of the things that he was dropping the ball on. Mm -hmm. Um, Because people loved him, right? He he had baptized them and their kids and their kids' kids, right? Mm -hmm. Like he had men there. And he was a wonderful man um, when he wasn't in a fit. Um, he's a wonderful man, period. At times he was in a fit, comma, and that was problematic. Uh, he wasn't the kind man that people knew him to be. And um, it wasn't until I hit kind of a breaking point that I went to the head of our, um, I'm Presbyterian, to the head of our church session, our church council, and sat on her couch. She gave me coffee and just broke down crying, and she took the coffee up from my hand and handed me a glass of wine. She's a good human being. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, and said, okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna support you. We're gonna figure out what this looks like. And within a week, she had gathered kind of a sub-council of trusted people. And they uh, asked me questions and cared for me and the one thing they did that it took me a while, because I must have not been paying attention to figure out, is they, tr- 
they took turns taking me out to lunch mm-hmm. every other week. Mm, so I didn't wow. figure out there was a schedule until later in August, and I was like, wait a second, <laughs> there's a pattern here. But they, and it wasn't, let me take you out to lunch, we have to talk about what's going on. Mm-hmm. It's, let me just take you out to lunch. And, and so the first thing to say is just, your pastor needs care too. Mm-hmm. And to create systems of care for your pastor, even if they don't necessarily have the capacity to ask for it. Mm-hmm. The second thing is to recognize that your pastor is on a spiritual walk too. Mm-hmm. And just like you have days of stumble and struggle and and, and, and mm-hmm. frustration with God and frustration with community, your pastor has that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that to recognize kind of that um, your pastor's going through that as well. And, and I'm gonna flip the script for just a second and then I'll stop talking. A lot of what I do in my work is around you know trauma and ministry. And a lot of times, the biggest gift or lesson I can give a clergy group is um, you are not immune to this. Mm. And please do not pretend to be immune to this. That's so good. You, if you are truly a part of your community and grounded in your community and serving your community, when communal trauma happens, when mass trauma happens, when traumatic things impact the congregation, it's going to impact you too. And you can't live outside of that bubble, right? Mm-hmm. And pretend like you can serve from outside in. That's not possible. And so we have to figure out how do you serve with, among, a company, mm-hmm. even as you are dealing with your own trauma and the trauma, traumatic fallout from the event. And then on the flip side, when I then go to congregations and get to talk to them and not clergy groups, mm-hmm. I always ask clergy to hush during this part. Because mm-hmm. I say, your pastor, your leader, your community organizer, your director is not immune to this, mm-hmm. right? And so what does it mean for us to just even recognize the humanity in one another mm-hmm. and care for that? That's good. Recognizing their humanity. Yeah, and just recognizing that they're trying to, mm-hmm. um, that, that they are still on their walk and they are still being impacted by the realities of the world. The pastors who have burnt out the fastest after the pandemic, there are a lot of ways burnout out of pastor in the pandemic, in my view, the number one way has been those pastors who pretended or acted or tried or believed that they had to pretend they were unaffected by it mm. to serve their communities well. Mm. The pastors who came through the strongest were those who were willing to team up with their communities mm. and mm-hmm. say, I need help with this yeah. because we are going through this as a community. Yeah. And so we need to be doing this as a community. Not, you all are hurting, let me come in like an external savior mm-hmm. and, and help. And, mm-hmm. and to me that that is, um, if you want to help with your clergy's not burning out, part of it is recognizing those moments when it is communal tasks and communal care and work that has to happen. That's good. That's strong. Mm-hmm. So we're at 58 minutes of my complete time. So I think that's a great place to land. And Ian, is that okay? Thank you guys so much for participating in the breakdown. I pray um, in the breakdown, you're able to break down some thoughts to build yourself back up. And I don't know if, if, if I was the only one, but a lot of things that you all shared was so helpful. And you don't realize what you need until you have a conversation. So thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. Kimberly. It was like a death. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I heard that name. Well, I'm here because I've learned to ignore it because my site supervisor, her name is Kimberlyn. Oh. Uh, so the, our a senior pastor calls her Pastor Kim. Mm. And so anytime I hear Pastor Kim or Kimberly, I immediately Skip. ignore it. <laughs> That's so funny because you said it and it was like something deep within me. <laughs> that's you! <laughs> <laughs> to me, it was like, that's her! <laughs> oh, 
Um, because the idea of the breakdown is going to be all with clergy for the most part. Anyway, and you're all clergy, so you know, just kind of go ahead and throw that in there. I know it's going to throw y'all off. Like, what? Okay, yeah, sure. But fun. So that's my presentation. You you are. You're definitely a celebrity. <laughs>